The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. For everyone on the line, I'd like to welcome you and say thank you for joining us today. I am Trish Hutcherson, Orion Health Corp's Marketing Director, and I will be with you through today's session as your moderator. On behalf of everyone at Orion, we hope you enjoy today's presentation. Before we do get started, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping items. Today's phone lines will be muted for the duration of the session. If, however, at any time you do have a question, please enter them into the GoToMeeting dashboard on your screen. We'll be answering technical and logistical questions in real time. However, questions related to the content of the presentation will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation. After today's session is over, you will be receiving a short survey, and we'd ask that you would just complete it to let us know how we did. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Jeffrey Daggerpont. Jeffrey is Senior Vice President of Coker Group, a national healthcare consulting firm. And Jeffrey specializes in healthcare automation, strategic planning, operations, and deployment of fully integrated information systems for medical practices and hospitals. Jeffrey is frequently engaged by highly respected organizations across the country to speak at their conferences and meetings. Additionally, he is the author of several published articles white papers and books with various publishers, including Health Leaders Media, American Medical Association, and HIMSS. And I would also like to quickly mention that we are both here in Atlanta, which we are experiencing very stormy weather today. So if for any reason we were to get knocked offline due to these storms, we will be communicating with you a rescheduled date for the webinar. But while we don't anticipate any interruptions, I did want to mention that just in case we suddenly disappear. So uh, Jeffrey, whenever you're ready, go ahead and get started. All right. Well, uh, let me first start by saying thank you, Trish. It, Trish, it's an absolute honor and privilege to um, present, and um, hopefully we'll weather the storm at least for the next uh, few minutes as, as we get through this. Uh, I just want to start off by saying that um, we're obviously going to cover uh, meaningful use, too, but I, I felt like it was very important to add uh, audits. As you may have heard, uh, I've been told that as much as many as 50% of the people who have attested will uh, get audited, and the concerning part about that is that you're only given two weeks to respond to the audit, and it probably will come to no surprise to anyone the auditing has actually been outsourced to an attorney, which is compensated based on recovery, much like the the RAC audit. So. Uh, you know, clearly there's going to have the need to, to be aware of what's going to be required, and I'm going to strongly encourage that everybody proactively be prepared versus waiting on some sort of notice, because I do think if there's a, a one in two chance that you would receive an audit letter and only have two weeks to respond, clearly any amount of uh, prevention or proactive preparedness will, will, will go a long way. So with that being said, um, I'm also clearly recognizing and understanding that even though many of you are attending a webinar about Meaningful Use 2, there's a good chance that some of you are still in the process of Meaningful Use 1, or maybe you haven't even attested at all, and you're just curious to see what, uh, how, how much more difficult it's going to get from 1 to 2, and certainly that's understandable. So I'm going to touch briefly on what Meaningful 1 looked like, and a little bit of the history there, simply because it's a great um, backdrop and it actually sets the stage and, and acts as the building blocks for, for stage two. So before I get into this, um, I wanted to, you know, I always like to use a prop when I speak and, and give presentations. And of course, I can't ask for a show of hands, but many of you may be familiar with the book, The Black Swan. Or more commonly, you may have heard someone ask you, don't let this be your black swan moment. And basically what that means is, the devastating consequences that can either happen to a person or to a company that doesn't prepare and doesn't plan for the future. A great example is the Kodak Corporation, a multi-billion dollar global uh, company dominated the world in, in, um, in, in film and whatnot. And of course, their black swan was the digital camera. They, they, they of course, should have saw it coming. But the book went into um, another example that I think in healthcare we could probably more easily relate to. And the, the, in, in this particular example, the scientists had analyzed food consumption over the lifespan of an animal. 
And they had concluded that the longer this animal lived, the more food this animal consumed. And you're probably thinking to yourself right about now, what in the heck does this have to do with meaningful use? But trust me, there is a takeaway, and I will make a point with this. So again, in this example, the longer the animal lived, the more food the animal consumed. However, there were devastating consequences coming to this animal, and it was this right here. Now, shouldn't the animal have known? They're getting free food. Their friends are leaving. They're not coming back. They're gaining all this weight. They're screaming in the background. And so the point here is that not being prepared, certainly for an audit, could, could absolutely have devastating consequences. And so much of what this presentation or the, the, the takeaway should be, and I always like to give the takeaway up front, is, is more or less a call of action. And to remind everyone that when you take federal money from the government, it, it does come with uh, some requirements to, to be in compliance. And, and again, towards the end, we'll address specifically what that means and how to prepare. And I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised that what you'll need to, to um, do to prepare for something like this is not as difficult as you, as you may think. So with that being said, let's just briefly look at the act itself. As many of you may recall, it was a considerable amount of money, $20 billion to be exact, that was set aside to pay physicians to adopt a certified uh, electronic health record. And just to show that, you know, it, how it was distributed, you may recall the, the actual stimulus um, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act included a lot of different areas uh, to stimulate the economy, but clearly health care received the largest portion of that. Uh, here's another way of looking at how the funds got distributed. $787 billion was the, the, the total uh, amount that got approved. And of course, $22 billion of it went directly into health care, with almost $19 billion or so being paid directly to physicians and hospitals to adopt electronic health records. So perhaps when this is all said and done, we'll all have bumper, bumper stickers that say, honk if I paid for your EHR, because it is a tax-funded initiative. There's, of course, been a lot of misinformation about it. Uh, some people have, a, have been fearful that this is part of health care reform and there's going to be a repeal or changes or modifications to health care reform. This has absolutely nothing to do with health care reform. This horse has left the barn. Uh, in fact, I think my next slide shows specifically how much money has already been paid out uh, right at about uh, this is probably up to about $7 million now since it goes back to July, maybe even more. Um, so clearly the money is getting paid. Now for you um, really smart people in the line that's probably already did the math, if you take the total number of physicians in the U.S. and you divide it into that number, technically you are correct. There's not enough money to go around for every physician and mid-level who would adopt. But keep in mind, not all eligible provide, or not all providers are considered eligible providers. You have to have a certain percentage of Medicare, uh, pediatricians, um, hospitalists or inpatient physicians, not doctors employed by hospitals, but doctors who work exclusively in the hospital, such as a radiologist, an anesthesiologist and whatnot, their, their compensation will come through the hospital side. So the, there are two programs, as you're probably well aware, and I'm going to address the auditing because it's going to be considerably different between the two. But one of the benefits of the Medicaid program is that the only requirement that you had to, to do your first year was just demonstrate your intent to adopt a, a certified electronic health record. So in other words, you sign your contract, you have good intentions, you submit it in, that's it. Under, and, and under Medicaid, both physicians and mid-levels were considered eligible providers. Under Medicare, only Medicare uh, only, only MDs and DOs were required, and under Medicare, in your first year, you had to demonstrate 90 days of meaningful use, and clearly you can see the difference in funding was 63750 for Medicaid and $44,000 uh, for, for the Medicare pathway. Now, you can switch between one and the other, but you can only do that one time uh, in, the, in the four or five years of the testing. This is something else I really want to point out to everyone on this line today. Um, there's a lot of misinformation specifically coming from vendors who want you to hurry up and buy their software. 
they are telling folks like yourself that if you don't hurry up and buy my software, your uh, stimulus money is going to dramatically diminish and, and it's going to be reduced. And by the way, you've probably been told that if you didn't get your first year in by the end of um, 2012, which was last year already passed, you have also lost money. Technically that's true, but it's nowhere near as dramatic as they would like for you to believe. Because look at the difference between 2012 and 2013. Instead of 44,000, it only goes down to, to, to 39. So in short, your first year is still your first year. You only have about 3,000 that comes off the first, and of course you lose the 2,000 on the end. So if you haven't done nothing, it's okay. You just you still got to get your 90 days in before the end of 2013. The first year has to be within a calendar year, and the second year has to be 12 months consecutively, which we'll discuss that in, in more detail in a second. But the real takeaway of this slide that I want to make sure everyone is extremely clear on, if you did not attest for your first 90 days or phase one by the end of 2012, you didn't lose that much money. And all you have to do is 90 days in 2013, and you're still eligible for up to 39000 So don't let vendors try to rush you into this decision. Um, and, and I don't say this to scare anyone, but 30% of the projects that COCA works on are actually removing cell DHR systems or going back in and helping clients that perhaps bought defective systems or systems that didn't work for your practice. So as we say here in Georgia, it's not dog food if the dog don't eat it. So, so make absolutely certain that whatever you buy is something that the doctors are going to use. It's physician friendly. It's going to work for your practice. There's too many. Um, you know, there's a, a, a graveyard full of people that have made critical mistakes of buying technology, being rushed into it before they were truly ready. So I'll get off my soapbox on that and back on point and back to the slide. So let's again just quickly look at, at, at Meaningful Use 1. As you probably recall, there were 15 or so core objectives that you had to pick from. And I, I brought the list here. And again, this slide deck is going to be emailed so you'll actually have the 15 requirements. Some of you would have been eligible to exclude yourself. So for example, if you were an ophthalmologist, you didn't have to track um, number nine uh, or smoking for any patients for that matter because it's not that germane to your specialty. The other thing they asked you to do is pick from a menu set and, um, and then you had to, to uh, you know, track and follow the, the clinical quality improvements in those areas. Now this is one of my favorite slides because a lot of times I get feedback, especially from physicians, that feel like this is extremely overwhelming. But if you think about the 15 or so requirements that they're asking you to track and you distribute that around the entire office, it's, it's really not that difficult. And furthermore, I would say that 80% of the requirements are things you're already doing, but you're just not tracking it in a certified EMR or in a way that it would count towards your attestation. So for example, problem list. I, I've never personally been to the doctor without them saying, what's your problem? So, in fact, I don't think you can bill for a charge unless you put a diagnosis code. So a lot of these things you inherently have to do anyway. Uh, look at the demographics that, you know, they ask you to track uh, language preferences and, and um, patient's ethnicity. What, what's the odds that the race of the patient's going to change from one visit to the next? So once you check that box, you're done. And here's the really cool thing. Every single practice that comes in, every single patient that comes into your practice counts towards the threshold, not just Medicare. You have to have Medicare patients in your practice to be eligible, but in terms of counting how many times you wrote an e, uh, an e for a pres prescription, every patient that you write an e-prescription on will count towards that threshold. So it, it's not difficult for those practices that will just be smart about it. And if you're not sure how to design, and I know this sounds a little self-serving, but I'd be more than happy to talk to any one of you about how to set up your workflow so that this stuff automatically happens and basically you'll almost guarantee yourself that you'll exceed all the thresholds by the time you get to the end of the 90 days with very limited disruption to your positions or workforce. All right, so the easiest and most simplest way I can describe phase two to everyone is it's exactly like phase one, just a little bit more stuff. So instead of your 15 core requirements, they bumped it up to, to 17, they've added three or five more menu objectives, uh, replaced some, got rid of some, so you still have a, a total of 20. And then hospitals, also they added more objectives to them as well, too. 
they've also revised the schedule. Now, this is something I think you guys will really enjoy, especially if you've already attested to phase one. There, as you probably are well aware, the guidelines for what you are expected to do are the requirements, stage two requirements, meaningful use requirements, are lagging behind the years in which you were eligible to start attesting. So for example, if you were really progressive and you did your 90 days in 2011, that means you could have did your first year, your second year, and your third year using phase one meaningful use requirements. If you're just now, if you just now did it in, if you did your 90 days in 2012, and you're now ready to do your 12 months of stage two, you can still use stage one requirements. You're not going to be required to use stage two requirements until 2014. So for some of you that were really ahead of the curve, this may be very well in your third year. In fact, you may get done by 2015 of all five years and never have to get to stage three or beyond. So there's, there is some advantage to getting this done earlier because the requirements lag behind. And I know this is a little bit of a busy schedule, but, but hopefully I'm making sense here. Basically, stage two meaningful use requirements are published. They're out there. They're telling you what you have to do. But if you're ready to go to stage two today or do, or do your second year, that's probably a better way to describe it. If you're ready to start your second year, which is 12 consecutive months, you can do so using stage one requirements. So if you pass stage one or your first year and you're ready to go, you don't have to use it until 2014. Now, something that was really interesting that really surprised a lot of us, for 2014 only in that year, whatever stage it's on or you land on, they're going to go back to only requiring you to do 90 days. Now, what I don't know if that's going to be 90 days within a calendar year or consecutive 90 days, I do know that the first year you had to do 90 days in a calendar year where stage two you only have to do 12 consecutive months. But I don't know with this 2014 twist if it's going to be calendar year or consecutive. Now you may be thinking, well, why would they go back to 90 days? And the reason why is because vendors are taking so long and it's become such a problem for them to develop and keep up with their software. And in fact, and we'll get into this towards the end, one of the, the, the areas that's driving a lot of these vendors to commercially discontinue products is because they're not capable of keeping their systems up to date and current with the mandates in a cost effective way. Uh, sometimes it's less expensive for them to just commercially discontinue the product and upgrade you to another generation that, uh, of, of solutions that they may have bought or, or developed alongside of their legacy product. The other thing that, that's coming out, as you'll see, um, or you may be aware of, is that they made a few exceptions. There's the, the patient and family engagement component. Uh, there's more along patient safety. Uh, there's going to be more along care coordination, population health, um, effective use of healthcare resources, and they're looking for a lot more effectiveness in your outcomes and whatnot. Um, patient portal, I, I thought it was on that list, but patient portal, oh, this is it right here. A new objective was uh, secure electronic messaging. So what that means or what that should translate to is patient portal. Now here's where I have a really major problem with a lot of the vendors in the market. They will all claim and tout that their product is certified for meaningful use. In fact, they'll even give you a link where you can go right to the ONC website and see that they have been approved by the government as a, as a good product that you should buy eligible for meaningful use dollars. However, they're leaving off critical modules like Portal, allowing you to buy the product as a, as a base system, and then they come back and say, oh, well, you do know you need to add Portal, and we can add that to you for you know, another $50 to $100 per month per provider. So any additional incentive money you get is just going from your, po from your pocket to theirs. So I think that's a little predatory. In fact, I would encourage all of you guys to really dig in on that and if nothing else, negotiate pretty hard or, or require them to include that. Because if you think about it, they inherently had to go to the government and say they had it to be recognized and to be certified, but yet they peel it off when it comes time to deliver it to you. So again, I, I know I'm making a, 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 a 
kind of a statement based on principle, but if they're going to go out there and tout themselves as a, as a certified product ready to go, then I think that certified product should include everything that's necessary. It's just my personal opinion, and I'd be happy to have that debate with any vendor who disagrees with me. Um, the second thing is, is more access and obviously available to view online. Again, that's pretty inherent with portals and whatnot. And then, of course, there's, there's new requirements for hospitals, uh, more medication tracking, um, and, and again, they also require hospitals to publish their information online through portals. There are some hardship exceptions, exceptions that came out too. So if you're a new eligible provider, less than two years in practice, they're given extensions. Um, if you had some kind of unexpected natural disaster, um, if you're here in Georgia today and get hit by a hurricane, I mean a tornado, you'll get an extension. Let's hope that's not the case, but if, it, if that, that was to happen, that's what that's for. Um, you know, and, and they've also extended the, the timelines and they're encouraging anyone who hasn't done so already, at least submit with your intent to adopt and, and you can always go back and you know, obviously adjust when you start but they're encouraging people to submit early. Now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about this auditing stuff. I think what I really want to emphasize is that sometimes when you hear words like a te you know, a testing or you just go online and fill out and, and say you did it, it seems very casual and very informal. In fact, it almost feels like, well, you know, if, if I'm, I'm an honest person, maybe you know, we got close, but I'll just go ahead and say we, we, you know, the requirement was 79%. I'm going to put down 80 because in the next day or so, we're going to cross the threshold whether we, you know, at some point. However, the government, and specifically CMS and the OIG, does not see it that way at all. In fact, this is verbatim what they are telling us that you are attesting to. <coughs> you are certifying that the information that you are providing is true and accurate. You are also acknowledging that you are receiving federal funds and that any false claim statements, documents, uh, or containment of facts to obtain this money will be prosecuted. And so they're not playing around. And in fact, I got interviewed by CMS and they specifically wanted to know my opinion if a doctor was close, would they likely still attest? In other words, it, it reinforces my, my assumption that they're going to draw a very hard line. If they say you must have problem lists, you know, 60% of the time, 59.9% .9 is not going to cut it. That's short. It's kind of like saying you're the tallest midget. You're still going to be short. It's, it's, I know that's not politically correct, but I really want to make something, a statement that will stick in your head. Do not attest if you're short. Uh, because that is the one thing that they're saying that they're getting people on. And what I find to be a little bit concerning is that if you've outsourced a testation to one of your uh, office managers or maybe someone in your office, you really need to verify because think of the fear of one of your staff members that has to come back and tell the doctors, oh, doctors, sorry, I set your system up wrong and you're going to have to do 90 days again. I could see a scenario where that person would be uncomfortable confessing to that or admitting to that, and they may just simply say, yes, my doctors did it, and the doctors unknowingly allowing someone to, to attest on their behalf. But again, CMS is not going to care. They're going to hold the physician responsible. So make sure if you are having someone in your practice attest for you that you actually verify that you did cross those thresholds. Um, it's also important to know what path you're on. So if you went the Medicaid route, I fear audits for them the most, and here's why. Because remember, the only thing Medicaid folks had to say they had to do to qualify to get money was I have the intentions to adopt an EHR. Well, it's going to be hard to hide that one if you didn't do anything. I mean, you know, they're going to call you up a year later and say, you know, what did you do with those good intentions? Well, I didn't really get around to it. So, and, and if you didn't get around to it and you didn't report and, and at least it let them know that you need extra time, I don't think they're going to be very sympathetic. So in the case of Medicaid, where you said, I have the intent to adopt, it's going to be very black and white, and you either adopted or you didn't. So if there was un some unforeseen delay or maybe the vendor uh, got held up, which reminds me, you need to hold these vendors accountable for hitting your timelines and that the product is not going to be defective or cause you to unintentionally report 
inaccurately. Again, they need to be held accountable for how their system works, and then more specifically, on Medicaid, don't say you intend and then let the vendor hold you up because they're not being responsive. The other thing that you want to make sure is you know what all the documentation and what you should be capturing and recording. And so um, what CPS is recommending is that you save all electronic documents and both electronic and paper, and they've even gone on to suggest that you take screenshots of your actual screen, computer screen, so you can demonstrate and show as proof that the feedback you got from your system indicated that you were uh, eligible and you, you met the requirements. So for example, here is a uh, meaningful use scorecard. And just by way of example, uh, the core requirement, the second on the list, this practice had a court required by Medicare, had to maintain active medication list 80% of the time. And you can see they did so 86.57% of the time. That's what you want to see. You want to see yourself exceeding the threshold. Let's take a look at the second one. Maintain active medication list or allergy medication list. They almost got 100% there. The government only required them to do it 80% of the time. Now, why on earth do you think they got 100%? Because they've probably been asking every patient since the practice opened 20 years ago, do you have any allergies? We all do that. So that's my point. Some of these things are inherently already built into your workflow and your practice. You're doing it today. So you should, there should be no excuse why you shouldn't just blow the doors off of these thresholds. Um, take a look at the next one, record demographics. The government only expected the practice to do it 50% of the time. I guess they didn't think some people would want to get paid because it, it would be hard to submit a claim without getting demographic information. But again, this practice did it 99.39% of the time. I'm not sure how that 61% that, that, uh, patient didn't register, but I guess that was maybe um, some kind of poacher guys or something. Who knows? But my point I'm trying to make here is that it, it shouldn't be that difficult, and your computer system, certified EMR, should give you this document. I would take a screenshot. I'd take a printed copy. I'd have it in the folder ready to go, ready to attach to your audit letter. The other way you can look at this, and this is a more advanced um, copy of dashboards, is that you have a little bit more dynamic real-time gauges that can show you in real-time where you're actually at. So you can see in this practice example, their current problem list, they're in the red, and you, we want to get them in the green. So as leaders or people that are overseeing this for your doctors, this really helps with enforcement. Yeah, this is an example of taking a screenshot of your registration screen. And here again, you see right there, you're asking for the language preference, ethnicity. You're making it very clear that you have these requirements in your system. So, you know, under Medicaid, again, just in summary to, 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 to make this clear, if you say you have the intent, they clearly expect you to follow through on that, that intention. Uh, close is only good in horseshoe. It's not going to be acceptable under Medicare or Medicaid. Not reporting honest mistakes is probably the worst thing you can do. When people get in a lot of trouble, it's almost always when they can prove you knew about it and didn't say anything about it. If your system malfunctions, you need to have something in your contract that says that the vendor will step in and protect you. Maybe even they cover your fines or replace any, any lost incentive that you may have as a result of their defective product and they'll ever allow one of your employees to embellish on the threshold. Make it very clear to your staff, especially if you're having someone do the attesting for you, that there's, it's a, a, a you know, uh, kind of like you tell your kids, there's no questions asked if, if they're in trouble. You know, admit it. Uh, they're not going to get fired. You're, you're obviously are going to be disappointed. But the last thing you want someone to, to have is that's going to be fearful of getting in trouble over an honest mistake, and out, out of that fear, they will embellish. So that's, that's, and that's where, in, in some cases, where there has been audits that have required them to return the money, to my knowledge, they've almost always been tied to a staff member that embellished the numbers on behalf of their doctors. So in summary, um, I think we need to make sure we got good policies, start preparing now for the audit. Again, if there's a 50% chance, you know, those are, those are not good odds. That's, that's, that's roulette table type stuff. So you want to make sure you're prepared. You know, be flexible and keep an open mind about your automation. Don't feel like it's, it has to be so overly 
um, you know, complicated. And then last but not least, I feel like I would be doing everyone a disservice if I didn't at least give you some really good tips of how to protect yourself from software not performing as, problem, as promised. Because remember earlier, I said that one of the major issues is that the vendors are not performing as, as we, sh we would expect them to. So one concern that I have is that we are seeing a lot of vendors commercially discontinue their product or just simply going out of business. So you don't ever want to buy software without having or requiring the vendor to put the source code into an escrow account. And what that basically means is that if anything ever happens to that vendor, that source code comes back to you from the escrow agent that allows you to reverse engineer your system, convert your data, transfer from one EMR to the next. I help people buy software all the time, but I will never allow a client to buy software without acceptance language. Basically what that says is that my client is buying the system, but they are not financially, they're not accepting financial obligation of the system until certain requirements and conditions get met. And trust me, when you put acceptance language in a contract, you will see a dramatic difference in improvement in how the vendor performs because they know your financial responsibility is predicated on their success of delivering the system as promised. And your acceptance requirement could be whatever is important to you. It doesn't have to be some you know, broad, I, I saw one vendor suggest that acceptance is when they deliver the software. Well, I don't know if I would call that acceptance. That, I mean, that's, that's you know, it's not that hard for FedEx to ship a disk. I physically want you to load it, test it, for, you know, that we're trained. I want to submit a claim. I want to write a prescription. I want to see that the system actually works as promised, just like it did in the demo. Uh, there may be implementation caveats you want to address in your contract. Is it going to be train the trainers, stages and phases? I see practices all the time start paying maintenance on parts of the system that they haven't even activated. So for example, if the portal is going to be charged on a per month per basis um, fee, it's, I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem with them charging you for it before they activate it. So you want to tie your financial terms to your implementation. The other thing <coughs> that really bothers me, and I see this a lot, is that vendors start charging annual maintenance the day you sign the contract. And that is just inherently wrong because if you think about it, it's probably going to be another 90 to 120 days before you're fully up and running on the system. So why start paying maintenance on software that's not even installed? Always defer that until after you go live. The same thing is true with your purchase terms. You want to stagger those as you go. Look at it this way. If you've ever built a house, you would never consider paying the roofer before paying for the foundation. And not only paying for the foundation, having it inspected and tested and looked out, doing a walkthrough, and then after you feel comfortable, you'll draw on your loan and you'll pay for that. Then you'll move on to framing. Uh, big IT projects can be, very, can be done the exact same way. You don't have to put all your money at risk up front. Also, this is very important for any private practice to know. Software is non-transferable. So if you ever go to sell your practice, the value of your practice can diminish greatly if you are not allowed or you did not get your contract to stipulate that you can transfer your EHR the one owner to the next. Moreover, what if you have a practice that or a physician that leaves? You want to be able to activate and deactivate those licenses as doctors or users come and go. Maybe there's a medical leave and you don't want to pay maintenance for a year while your physician's recovering on medical leave. So make sure you have protection to transfer license and activate and deactivate. Furthermore, you may add future doctors. So you want to put some, some caps and thresholds on what you'll pay for services and licenses uh, down the road, even though you may or may not need them. Uh, I will tell you if I was, you know, if we were standing here in the room together, I would look you right in the eyes and tell you I would never advise a client to buy a system unless they were entitled to future upgrades, new releases, new versions, because we've already established that the market and the technology is changing dramatically and very rapidly. There's going to be a lot of disruptions. ICD-10, healthcare reform, multiple stages of meaningful use, your vendor is going to have to continue to modify and evolve their system, and you should be entitled to those future upgrades. 
Um, you know, if you think about it, who do we know who's made billions and billions of dollars um, selling the software only to discontinue it later? Well, of course, I can't hear you answer, but many of you may be thinking or have said in your head, it's Microsoft. And you're absolutely right. Every two years, they come back, they sell us a, a new version of Windows, and then they discontinue it and they, and they move on. The other thing that I want you to make sure of is that you have very strong warranties in your contract. The average vendor warranty only lasts 90 days meaning in most cases your warranty expires before you install the software. Warranty should be very explicit. Also, carefully review your termination language. Most contracts stipulate that immediately upon termination you must shut down the system or worse, they can remote in and disable it. Or even worse than that, they may have installed disabling software on your servers that will automatically shut you down. You must remove any uh, ability for anyone to disable you remotely or through contractual reasons because everyone will need time to transition off of a system after termination. Uh, and then of course as we talked about future providers and then recurring costs. One test you can all do, go back and look and see what you're paying on annual maintenance. The industry average is somewhere between 15 to 21 percent of what you pay for the software is what you should be paying in support fees every year. And if that if you're paying more than that, and you've been on the system for many years, I would have a conversation with my vendor about lowering that rate. Um, the other thing that, and I know I'm kind of doing a bombing run on everyone with these contract terms, but um, one of the things that, that we would absolutely do as a favor of Orion for any one of you, at no cost to you, we will review an EMR contract or a vendor contract that you're either thinking about signing or renewing. And the reason why we offer that at no charge is that it really allows me to, to get good at doing what I'm doing. If I can see a lot of vendor contracts, I can create transparency. I can do webinars where I can share some of the concerns and the threats that I've seen out there. Because quite honestly, when you have organizations like Orion that can, that can knowledge share, aggregate folks like yourself, and, and leverage and flex their muscle, that's really the, the added value that, that they bring to the table. And of course, we would be more than happy to provide that. Um, if you obviously want to take us up on that, you can either contact myself or, or Trish. I think uh, there's a, a slide at the end. Unless you have any questions, um, you can type them here. Uh, or, or you, and there's my email address. Um, I'll leave the, the, this slide up in case anyone wants to ask any questions. If you do have questions and you haven't typed them in already, you can just type them in. Uh, we do always leave a, a few minutes for uh, questions and answers. So I'll shut up for a couple minutes and see if anyone comes through. If not, I'll, um, I'll, I'll wrap up and, and we can end and do so before the storm sets. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, we did have a couple questions pop in, but just to um, echo what Jeffrey said, if you do have any questions that you haven't asked yet, please feel free to type those into the dashboard provided by GoToMeeting. Um, we had a question about where do we find the form for exceptions? Uh, it's on the CMS website. I will do some research, Trish, uh, and see if I can get that link to you so you can distribute it with the uh, handouts. Great. And uh, what is your opinion on how a hospital-based MD, such as a radiologist or anesthesiologist, might participate? Well, here's the thing. As long as they are, uh, they can still, as long as, I think it, the, the threshold is 80% of their time must be spent in the ambulatory setting or in the clinical setting, even if the, um, the, the doctor is owned by the hospital or works exclusively for the hospital. So just because they, they operate in the, the hospital, in most cases, if they spend a good portion of their time also in their practice or in the ambulatory setting, they can still qualify. If that's not the case, I would, I would try to encourage them to have a conversation with the hospital about how they would be distributing some of the incentives because keep in mind that the anesthesiologist or radiologist is having to make a contribution to help the hospital get their money and that contribution may very well come at a cost of some decrease in productivity or extra work. Now I don't think the hospital is going to give all their money to the doctors because their argument is going to be, look, we paid for the system, we took all the risk and you didn't have any skin in the game. But I could easily make a have a conversation on behalf of any radiologists or, or anesthesiologists to point out to the hospital executives that 
that the doctor is contributing, and moreover, their participation sets them up for cost-based reimbursement or savings-based reimbursement, all their quality initiatives. So they really need to um, reward doctors who, who cooperate, in my opinion. Okay, next question. We are an urgent care group. Does anything specifically change in regards to urgent care? Not so much. I, 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 last time I heard this sim, a similar question come up is that urgent care, you know, and, and this is true in some cases, is, is, has, is sort of become the new primary care for a lot of, a lot of patients, especially in markets where, you know, um, there's, not, there's a lot of uninsured. But in most cases, uh, urgent care are really going through the same requirements as, as most of the primary care physicians. Uh, I would look at the list. There should be a list uh, by specialty of what you can exclude. I don't recall seeing anything germane to urgent care. I know uh, for sure ophthalmology had uh, smoking that you could exclude. Um, pediatrics that don't have Medicare can obviously, if they have enough Medicaid, they're, they're eligible to do with that. And here's the other thing with urgent care. Some urgent care clinics have a hard time hitting the Medicare volume threshold. You have to have at least 125 percent of your practice makeup must, be, must consist of Medicare patients. So what that translates to is you have to do about $64,000, dollars a year of Medicare billing to get the full $44,000. And not all, sometimes urgent cares don't have a lot of Medicare patients. But let's say you're only doing about $20,000 in Medicare billing, you can still participate. They just gross down your 44000 based on what your percentage of the 44000 you're at. But, but Medicare wants to see, to be eligible, you have to have at least 125% billable charges going out to Medicare uh, every year, which is pretty easy in most cases. Okay. Um, we are a radiology hospital located. We do not qualify for meaningful use due to the lack of ambulatory software and staff support. I understand we can file a five-year exception. Is this, tr is this form available? And P.S. the hospital is only required to participate in inpatient criteria. Gotcha. Um, yes, I, the, the last point is true, and I think that hospitals, some hospitals that are doing the inpatient, some of their requirements are tied to CPOE. That, that does require physician participation and involvement. I've seen everything from taking the position that they won't share to they will share some. Uh, usually it can come as a form of salary and whatnot. As far as the form, I don't have it. Um, if I leave my screen, it'll, it'll mess up the webinar, but I will try to do some research and find where that, that form can be located to, to submit. And if we do find where that is located, we will pop that link out to the group who is on the line so that you all have access to it. Uh, next question, what risks do we take attesting if our reporting software does not agree with our EMR audits? We have several qualifiers that are over the threshold in our audits, but under threshold in our reporting software provided by the same vendor. Yeah, I would really want to remediate that because you don't want any gray areas on, on what's, on, on, on what's um, being reported. I may have misunderstood the question, but it sounds like the the, the software may not be reconciling with the actual. And so um, in cases where you've exceeded the threshold, um, and, 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 and some of these, especially the ones like maintain allergy list that's so low, most of the time the client is confident enough that they know they're just simply doing that on every practice they can patient they can back it up. Um, if there's areas where you're not sure, I would, I would self-audit yourself and maybe run a, a mock trial to see how you, how you run against your own, um, you know, self-auditing, it may be that you actually have to, you know, go back and, and do some reconciliation. But if you feel there's any discrepancy between what you did and what the system's reporting, I would engage the vendor immediately. You might even talk to other users and find out if they've experienced that same thing. Okay, next question. How do you determine if our pediatric office, which is five docs and two nurse practitioners, would qualify for meaningful use? Um, well, and, and that's a great question because I, I should have clarified this. It's not by practice. It, it's by individual eligible provider. So in the case of pedi pediatrics, you'd want to see which providers had at least 30 percent of their patient mix volume was, um, was, was Medicaid. And, if, and if there may be, and I, I wouldn't encourage you to go recruit a bunch of Medicaid patients to get there, 
but there is the chance that you could have one provider that only has 20% of their patient mix is Medicaid and, and uh, another one at 40. Now, some med pediatric practices really will have open access scheduling, and they really don't assign their patients to their providers. So you really kind of want to look at it, you know, if you, hopefully you have enough Medicaid that it would average out for everyone, but you really want to look at the, the percentage of, of your revenue and patient mix of what it is, is contained with Medicaid. That, that's the threshold they're looking for, and the magic number is 30%. Okay. This is a uh, longer question, so if you need me to repeat it, Jeffrey, I'd be happy to have just let me know. We are a radiology group that practices in hospitals and outpatient clinics. We were under the impression that to even attest to meaningful use, we first must have each provider radiologist meet the 50% rule, meaning 50% or more of all encounters from all sites must occur at a site where a certified EHR is in place in order to attest to meaningful use. Is that correct? That is my understanding. I appreciate you bringing the 50% rule. I think I, I misspoke and may have said 80, but there is a, a requirement that a, a doctor who's normally considered um, an inpatient that, that, that performs his or her services in the inpatient, if they at least do 50% of their services in the outpatient setting with a certified EHR, that's, that is the requirement, at least what I recall it to be. I think that, that the uh, Academy of Radiology was, was lobbying pretty hard to get that changed um, because, you know, unfortunately they don't have a lot of control where their patients, uh, you know, in most cases they're going to be admitted and they have to they have to go to the hospital, and then the follow up they sometimes get lost to the surgeons. So I think anesthesiology and radiology, uh, in particular, uh, should hopefully they will make some exceptions in that. Okay, that was the last question that we had, and just a reminder to everybody on the line that we did record today's session, and we'll be sending out the slides along with the audio playback option so you can listen to that at your convenience and as soon as it becomes available, which might be an hour or so, we might, uh, hour or two, we will get that out to you as soon as it becomes available. So we would again like to thank you for participating with us in today's webinar. We'd like to um, share with you the date for February's webinar, which we have planned on the 13th, which will be a radiology coding update for 2013. So we'll be sending out announcements about that coming up shortly. But again, thank you for participating. Thank you, Jeffrey, for a great presentation. And have a great day. All right. Thank you, guys.